So after nine months of it being in early access, the Outlast Trials recently celebrated its full release. Over the course of those nine months, Red Barrels have been tweaking and refining the gameplay, adding lore in the form of documents, and fleshing out various characters in the game along with their backstories. Before we begin, please note that there will potentially be heavy spoilers for Outlast 1, Whistleblower Outlast 2, Trials, and the Murkoff account comics, so please proceed with caution. Let's begin. A few months ago, we got the winter update for Outlast Trials, and this update was focused on political tensions between the US and the Soviets. The idea of the gameplay was to blast cold air inside the trial environments, and the purpose of this was to prepare reagents for cold weather. A chat between Murkoff employee A. Bradley Avianos and CIA liaison for Murkoff Jameson Lawler sees Lawler state that its snow may fall on Cuba. The CIA were foreseeing that at some point they may need to drop a nuke on Cuba and that there would be a nuclear winter, hence the snow comment. They still potentially need their reagents to go into Cuba and assassinate certain targets. This update also saw an examination into Easterman's obsession with charisma and how his prime assets would have the same type of charisma that Adolf Hitler possessed. He wanted people that would be able to turn a crowd of normal people into a mob of lunatics within minutes. But this update isn't really relevant to what we're going to discuss in this video. The first of the endings that we got with Trials revealed that the Signala facility was in fact part of the towers that Blake Langerman saw in Outlast 2 hence the bright flashes of white light and the deafening sounds. The ending saw the reagent had been sent to Habana, Cuba, in order to assassinate Fidel Castro. They woke up in their room covered in blood with the sound of chaos on the streets below. The phone rang and it was Easterman's voice saying the sleeper agent trigger words, spider, eye, and lamb. The second ending, which released with the program Geister update, saw another reagent had been sent to Vietnam. They were driving a car and crashed outside the Hotel Saigon, which was hosting a friendship conference between South Vietnam and the US. The reagent had a bomb strapped to them and seemed to come to their senses just before the explosion. This was a false flag attack on the friendship conference in order to stoke up tensions between the US and South Vietnam and the communist North. The CIA made it look like the North Vietnamese were responsible. As many of you do already know, as mentioned in documents from Outlast 1, years after the Second World War in 1949, Rudolf Wernicke was brought to the US as part of Operation Paperclip, or Project 63, which sought to bring prominent, skilled German and Austrian personnel to the US and conduct research for them so as to deny their services to potential enemies. As mentioned in the obituary for Dr. Wernicke, he was stationed as a researcher in Los Alamos, the government research facility which was the location for the creation of the atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project. When Wernicke arrived at Los Alamos in 1949, he got to work in further developing his research into dream therapy for the recently formed CIA using microwave signals and guided dream therapy. It was around this time that Murkoff employee A. Bradley Avianos wrote to the Murkoff board and informed them of a potential partnership with the CIA which would mean massive revenues for Murkoff and huge tax savings to go with it. Four years later in 1953, a civilian named Hendrik Joliet Easterman would be sent to Hong Kong in order to study brainwashing victims, Western and Chinese veterans of the Korean War. Easterman found no evidence of brainwashing, but he was impressed with the level of trauma that the subjects possessed. Now this is where Easterman would first encounter or see evidence of Dr. Skinner. The following year in 54, Avianos would effectively blackmail the CIA into a partnership with Murkoff, threatening to expose their previous arrangements, with Murkoff having assisted the CIA in matters needing pharmaceutical assistance in the past, such as providing Kang Chai Shek's anti-communist rebels in Thailand and Burma with heroin to sell in order to fund their activities. Mount Massive Hospital staff in Colorado were also conducting their own research into behavioural programming, involving two female patients, Mrs. Jackson and Pierce, in which Miss Pierce, who had an intense fear of firearms, would be convinced to pick up the weapon and fire it at Miss Jackson. After the event, Miss Pierce had no memory of the event. That same year, in 1954, Easterman would be approached by the Assistant Director of Behavioural Medicine at Mount Massive Hospital, Olivier Baranchik, who mentions that Easterman's findings in Hong Kong align well with Wernicke's dream therapy in Los Alamos. Easterman was sent to the CIA's Los Alamos labs to meet the researchers, including Wernicke. Branchik basically threatened to silence Easterman if he didn't agree to work for Murkoff. After meeting Wernicke, Easterman considered the man to be delusional and put it down to his guilt for his participation in what the Nazis did during the war. Easterman left confused as to how Wernicke's results and findings have been vetted and accepted. 
Easterman would be warned against talking politics with Wernicke, and Baranchik thinks Easterman's work into brainwashing and revising people's ideology should mesh seamlessly with Wernicke's microwave signals and guided visual stimulation. Easterman notes that he has been experiencing strange dreams ever since his arrival in Los Alamos. In 1958, Jameson Lawler would send an MK Ultra excerpt to the CIA's Technical Services Division regarding psychochemical and non-chemical methods of accomplishing political action operations, and this allows Wernicke's Project Woolrider to receive continued funding. Test subjects from the project were showing metallic tumours in the brain. Lawler also made reference to a previous excerpt from 1938. In the letter that Lawler is referring to, Wernicke's work in developing the morphogenic engine was discussed in a letter that would be passed on to the playwright Dietrich Eckhart, who was one of the founders of the German Workers' Party, the party that would eventually be the precursor to the Nazi Party. Eckhart was essentially the mentor of Adolf Hitler. The letter detailed the work of Wernicke and how it had breached the spiritual realm, with the author of the note saying that he had witnessed the appearance of an apparition, something that Wernicke would address and refute in his exit interview. Do you believe test subjects achieve something supernatural? No. Do you think that they contacted something supernatural? Nothing is supernatural. Then what was it? You said Project Wallrider was a gateway. A gateway to what? The letter also stated that Wernicke's work was of such potential for the German people that he should be kept out of any sort of culling program due to his disability and potential homosexuality. In this same year, Project Lathe was to begin, which would focus on subconscious triggers and would spectacularly fail. Lathe utilised patients from Mount Massive Hospital. However, these subjects were already too broken for the therapy to have any effect. Watch my other Outlast Trials video to learn more about that, but anyway, after Lathe failed, Lathe 2 would begin using the Mount Massive patients from before as the experimental population, and Murkoff would set up charitable outreach centres as a way to recruit desperate, lonely and vulnerable people into the programme. Easterman then wrote to Olivier Baranchik about Lathe 2, and he mentioned tumour-like growths on the brains of the subjects. Easterman then began to correlate the growths on the brain to the Skinner Man. Baranchik insisted on Easterman reporting back to Wernicke's team in Los Alamos when it came to the Skinner Man, much to Easterman's displeasure, believing it to be a dead end, and trying to convince himself that the Skinner Man is not in fact a projection of himself. With Lave 2 underway, Branchik wrote to Avianos and stated that Wernicke's lab in Los Alamos and his paperclip colleagues were showing an extreme fixation on released reagents coming out of Signala, one in particular being a reagent designated 0877, who was reported to have achieved ascendance. The paperclip team wanted more like this. Branchik also shows concern in regard to secret conversations in which the paperclip team would speak in German, and when translated, they talked about how they thought that Easterman had made a big scientific mistake in what he had discovered through Lathe 2. Last Halloween, we got an update titled Program Geister, and this program's gameplay was based more around tapping into the hallucinations and psychosis suffered by the reagents, and this event's documents really started to explore the connections between Dr. Wernicke and Dr. Easterman. After seeing the potential of some of the reagents coming out of Signala, along with the tumour-like growths on the brain, which were of course something he'd seen through his own research, Wernicke then began working more closely to Project Lathe. He'd watched the reagents sleep, which explains his presence above the sleep room, with Nurse Barlow reporting Wernicke's behaviour. He likely wants to learn the process. In the Geister documents, we saw that Eastman wasn't particularly pleased with the fact that Wernicke was getting so close to Project Lathe, as he compared his dream therapy to performing surgery with a chainsaw instead of a scalpel, and he hated the fact that Wernicke was haunting the sleep room. Easterman's journals also revealed that Wernicke had been participating in the reagent's trauma therapy. Essentially, Easterman was concerned that Wernicke's work would infect his work with Project Lathe. This was compounded by the fact that the CIA and Murkoff would require Easterman and Wernicke to start working together, as Easterman's Project Lathe was becoming a costly affair and was quite simply taking too long, given the sensitivity of what was happening in the political sphere. Another interesting thing we got in the Geister update was that A. Bradley Avellanos wrote to the board reporting certain side effects from Project Lathe. They mentioned Reagent 0877 again, who was previously described as special. The side effects described what appeared to be shared hallucinations. Avianos refers to extrasensory activity relating to the Skinner Man being experienced by unrelated reagents in separate trials. The Geister trials were Wernicke's proposal, and any results were to be shared with the research teams at Los Alamos and with the staff at Mount Massive Hospital. Easterman was likely viewed as the Skinner Man because of the concept of the Skinner Box. 
an operant conditioning chamber created by a B.F. Skinner, where animals such as rats were rewarded for engaging in certain behaviours. He is the man pushing the rats, the reagents, into the box, which are the trial environments, and influencing their behaviours. Hence, Dr. Skinner. Anyway, the programme was approved by the board, but Easterman was concerned about the board having dangerous expectations for the programme. Been in that cell for weeks. We had to allow for altitude adjustment. Fernicke's proposal requires a robust immune system. Good luck, friend. There's almost as much tumour in this scan as gray matter. I guess if it's a lethal experiment, we might as well use someone who's as good as dead. If we only wanted to dispose of a corpse, we wouldn't have made a trip to Colorado. What you're calling tumors maybe is the fingerprints of a god. What's that supposed to mean? What happens when somebody gets touched by a god? Usually they're smart, but sometimes they're very, very sad. So let's discuss this ending. At the start, we see another reagent in the distance in a containment unit of some sort. We can only assume that our reagent is in a similar one. Our reagent has a breathing tube, which resembles the state that Miles Upshur found Billy Hope in whilst he was in his pod and hooked up to the morphogenic engine. The researchers with Wernicke state that the scans revealed as many tumours as there was grey matter. This tumour thing is something that has been seen throughout the Outlast series. Of course, we see it mentioned in the documents in the trials, but we also see it through documents in Outlast 1 and in the Murkoff account comics in Outlast 2. It's seen through the 1938 letter about Wernicke's work and through Lawler's letter to technical services in which he mentions metallic tumours. It's seen in the comics in regard to the story of the Jane Doe, a young woman that escaped Sullivan Noth's Temple Gate cult and who was pregnant. A hospital scan revealed lesions and tumours on her brain, and these were described as lead-based tumours. In June of 1943, you recorded three instances of spontaneous bleeding. Uh, a half a dozen test subjects began to develop brain tumours? Yes. The autopsies revealed that the tumours were pure lead. The next thing they mentioned in the ending is that they took the reagent all the way to Colorado, which means that the location they are in is underneath Mount Massive Hospital in Colorado. It's possible that this ending takes place in 1959, it could take place a little bit later, but in 1967, Mount Massive Asylum was founded, but then shut down in 1971, being reopened by Murkoff Psychiatric Systems in 2009 under the guise of, you guessed it, a charitable organisation. Anyway, next, Wernicke talks about the tumours potentially being the fingerprints of a god. He's obviously referring to the Wall Rider. This person wouldn't have been the first subject for the morphogenic engine though, as it seems that the scream as seen in the trial environments were exposed to the engine back in World War II. They'd be forced to scream until their psychology changed. Later versions of the screamers had been forced into a waking nightmare state with the help of amphetamines at Los Alamos. Wernicke's observation of the reagent sleep patterns in the sleep room, the trauma that they went through, the horrors they saw in the trials, likely led him to the belief that only those who had witnessed enough horror were capable of activating the engine, which, of course, is what Wernicke said during his Murkoff exit interview. The human mind in that environment is capable of extraordinary things. You're saying the experiment needed... The proximity to death, to overwhelming madness. Only a test subject who had witnessed enough horror was capable of activating the engine. It's probably safe to assume that this reagent didn't become a host for the War Rider, as we see that Billy Hope ends up reaching lateral ascension years later, in part thanks to his lucid dream state. This is why Wernicke mentions the word ascension, as the contraption they are standing in front of, and that the reagent is hooked up to, is the early version of the morphogenic engine that has been refined and further developed by the time we see it in Outlast 1. The video that plays on the screen is the guided dream therapy that Billy was subjected to whilst inside his life pod. And finally, dark tendrils start to appear, likely inside the reagent's mind, and this is an indication of the Skinner Man. In another of my Outlast videos, I floated a theory that Reagent 0877 was in fact Simon Peacock. Now we have a little more information on what happens to the most promising reagents released from Signala, that they are being placed into the morphogenic engine, I think it gives my theory of Simon Peacock being reagent 0877 some more weight when you consider what he says to Paul Marion in issue 6 of the Murkoff account, that he was a rough draft, 
and that Billy Hope and Miles Upshur's Wall Rider was the masterpiece. And that's pretty much it for this short video analysing the new ending. Hopefully this video helped provide some context to the ending and what it could potentially mean. I hope that Red Barrels continues to release new lore. I may do a theory video soon on the spider-eyed lamb's connection to the cult, Sullivan Noth and Noth's Gospel from Outlast 2. But as for this video, please leave a like on it if you enjoyed it, leave a comment below with your theories and subscribe if you aren't already. But for now, take care and I will see you in the next one.